Good morning. Happy New Year. Yeah, there we go. All right. Well, as we begin, we want to uh, touch on the announcements. I think we'll touch on the announcement with an announcement. Jim uh, is going to uh, announce the annual meeting. We'll have you come up, Jim. Let's give him a hand. Give him a hand, yeah. <laughs> Let's see how he does first. No. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, the uh, church board has decided January 15th will be our annual meeting. And in the bulletin, you can see here where it says 1 o'clock. Last year, it was at 12 o'clock noon. So I think we should continue on with the 12 o'clock. So uh, that'll still give us time to uh, have Sunday school and uh, we're going to have uh, pizza on the menu, so uh, then we will uh, uh, continue with the meeting at noon o'clock. He did, he did fine, yeah, give him a... I didn't see a standing ovation though, Jim. That was kind of a... <laughs> you'll have to work on it uh, for next year, I guess, or next time, next time. Um, you know, even before we get into the announcements, on the back of your bulletin, and uh, I think maybe somebody needs to hear this, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking about a thorn in the flesh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. And then there's a poem by Dean Beatty. It says, take it from Paul who struggled in pain. Though he sought God thrice, it was all in vain. Nothing had changed. He was still in God's hand. Abundant grace was what God had planned. We don't know for sure what was Paul's thorn, but God gave him grace that it might be born. Paul kept the thorn, seeing God in it all. Sufficient grace was God's gift to Paul. What do you bear as your thorn in the flesh? God's purpose for it keeps your soul's focus fresh. See it from God's view, what he has allowed, Lift up your eyes as you keep your knees bowed. My grace is sufficient. Take that truth to heart. God's presence and love will never depart. God is thoroughly aware of the trials we face, and through them he's given the gift of his grace. And uh, you can look up that 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9, where whatever it was, Paul had gone to the Lord, and it says he, he sought the Lord three times. And I think we're talking about fasting and prayer and, and truly seeking whatever that was. And God says, I'm not removing it, but I'm going to give you enough grace to help you. And, uh, of course, Paul, God used to write about half of the New Testament, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Uh, as we uh, touch, continue on the announcements, we will have Sunday school afterwards and continue with... Um, uh, our, our study with the Christmas record uh, with Lee Strobel it's in the discussion time. It's a, it's a great look at um, the Christmas record. So I hope you'll stay for that. Also, uh, there will be Children's Church and uh, be after our next song. And uh, you also will see, uh, or after our uh, Whiter Than Snow song, um, Wednesday, uh, confirmation and Bible study and prayer. I think they are prophesying more snow, but we'll see how that goes. Uh, Saturday, men's Bible study and a church board meeting on the night. Um, anything else? And then the craft on January 13th, 5 o'clock. And then uh, Saturday, the women, men's and women's Bible study, the 14th. And then, as Jim announced, the annual meeting on the 15th. And we'll have communion that day as well. Any other announcements that need to be made? Sean? Um, Pardon? Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, actually, I'm going to be, I'm planning on being gone one uh, Wednesday, the Wednesday before, so. Okay, very good. Thank you, though. Um, anything else? 
All right. Well, let's uh, go ahead and pray. Um, glad to have our son-in-law, Jake. Mercy was not feeling well. Uh, she wanted to come, but didn't want to get anybody sick. She has kind of a cold. And so we're going to pray for her. Also, uh, Leah, uh, Dave and Mary's daughter, is doing, you know, continues to improve. She was in that car accident. Uh, Esther Klima, be praying for her. Uh, she had the knee surgery, and then she got in, uh, sick. And uh, so you can be praying for her. Um, I don't, I'm going to hold off on somebody else that was in an accident that uh, they came out okay, but I'm sure they're awful sore. And uh, so let's uh, go ahead and uh, join together in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you, we thank you that this is the day that you have made, that we have a, a new year. And yet, Lord, we know that your mercies are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. It doesn't have to be January 1st of any year, but we can have immediate cleansing and uh, confidence that you are with us. And so, Lord, as we come today, I pray that your Holy Spirit will speak to each one of us that, Lord, those that are watching online, those that are here present, that they might be, each one of us might be moved closer to you and to recognize that you have plans for us. Even as you told the people in Jeremiah's day, I know the plans, the thoughts, the ideas I have for you, says the Lord. And so, Lord, we know that they are good. We lift up these that are recovering, those that uh, are not feeling well, that your hand would be upon them, those that are here today, that there's something they're struggling with, that they might roll that burden upon you. Even as Peter said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you. And so as we come, we commit this service to you. We commit ourselves to you. We pray for our leaders, our country, that we might turn back towards you. We have drifted so far away from you as a nation. But Lord, you are willing to receive us if we will but turn to you. And so we as individuals... And we pray for our nation that we turn to you, Lord. We look to you. We ask for your help, your guidance. Uh, we pray for, uh, I know Marion's uh, mom is struggling with the loss of her friend. We pray that your hand would be upon her and be strengthening her and uh, giving her grace and guiding her. And Lord, I pray that for others here, that whatever they may be uh, uh, fearful of or afraid of for the future, that they would see you bigger than anything that could possibly be looming. You are bigger and greater, and, and you are so awesome. And so we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> uh, glad to have uh, the Barons. We'll be doing the music this morning. Uh, Paul Nickel, one of our elders. We have Jay Understad on the camera and Larry Dostal on the sound. <clears throat> Okay, well, good morning, everybody. We're just going to start off with uh, hymn number 290, as with gladness, men of old. So if you want to stand for that. Personally, this is one of my favorites, being an old guy. I grew up in the church, and I always remember this as one of my favorite hymns. It's really like a big prayer that Jesus would just lead us into the next year. So let's all rise and sing together hymn number 290, as with gladness, men of old. Small. 
Please remain standing and uh, find the responsive reading in your bulletin, please. And this comes from Psalm 33, verse 3 and 10 to 11. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. Amen. And now you may be seated. And then we're going to ask the ushers to come forward and collect the offering today.
Thank you, dear Lord, for this new year. Thank you so much for how you've blessed us and provided for us in the past year and how you, we know that you will in the future, in, in 2023. And we thank you for these, uh, this first week of gifts and offering for the year. And uh, we pray that you'd help our church to, to make good use of these funds, Lord, multiply them and do, and do kingdom work through them. And uh, we just thank you, Lord, that we can continue on as Grace Bible Church and, and uphold your word in our community. And, and uh, we just ask you for your blessing on this year and, and on the rest of this service. In Jesus' name yeah. we pray. Yes, and Amen. while we're still praying, I know uh, Janet Peterson just sent in that um, her fam the, the dad of her kids passed away last night. So we want to pray for them that they might have comfort and peace and grace and um, that they might sense your presence and uh, we pray for Janet as well. You'd be helping her and that she might have wisdom and how to comfort. And uh, we thank you for those that have joined us online and, and those that are here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now we're going to have uh, another hymn, number 653. You may be seated. If you have your Bibles, if you'd open to Jeremiah chapter 29. And 
There is something about a new year, and this is the first day of the new year. But you know, every day is ultimately new with the Lord. It can be a fresh start. We don't have to you know, wait until a new year. And God has plans for you and for me. He has plans for this world, but he also has plans for individuals. And we are called to seek that plan and to seek his faith. Uh, I sometimes have to take quoting him, but comedian Woody Allen, uh, he said this, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. You know, I mean, sometimes our plans can be pretty ridiculous because we have no control of, over things, and yet we are to make plans. I think Paul had plans to try and share the gospel and to preach the gospel. Chuck Swindoll, he said, God's heavenly plan doesn't always make earthly sense. To us, it doesn't seem like it's much of a plan. The late Peter Marshall, he lived from 1902 to 1949. He served as chaplain to the U.S. Senate. And uh, there was a movie made about him. It's really a fascinating movie. But he said this, God will not permit any troubles to come upon us unless he has a specific plan by which great blessing can come out of the difficulty. He does use things, doesn't he? Scottish athlete, sprinter, Olympian, and he ended up being a missionary and then died uh, basically at a young age. Uh, Eric Liddell, remember Chariots of Fire? Yeah. He said the circumstances may appear to wreck our lives and God's plans, but God is not helpless among the ruins. I like that. God is not helpless among the ruins. I... Sometimes difficulties reveal things. I remember, uh, and I'll say his name because I, I was, he, it was amazing to me, Louis King. And somebody watching probably knows Louis. And when we first started the Christian Deer Hunters Association, uh, we were meeting in the library. And after one of those meetings, Louis invited me to come over to his place. And he, uh, he, had, he had shot some nice bucks and things like that. But not too long later, his garage burnt, and he had all these racks and stuff in there. He had a couple of months in the house, and, it, and he said all they found was a little piece of bone, or, or antler about this big, and he just took it so well. I would not have taken it that well, and I was just so impressed by that. But in the ruins, I got to see something about Louie, a passionate deer hunter, but I, I saw that he held it loosely. And sometimes what you may be going through, it may be because it ends up being a great encouragement to somebody else. Or somebody else sees the reality I've, over the years. That's one of the privileges of being a pastor. When people go through the deepest, darkest times, to see them continue on with the Lord, um, Sometimes as a pastor, I get to, from a little bit more of a privileged sight and a painful sight, too. And, of course, it's the other way. When people that you would think would be faithful during difficult times are not, it shakes you as well. But I love that God is not helpless among the ruins. Uh, A.W. Tozer, author and theologian, he went to be with the Lord in 1963, but he said, God's plan will continue on God's schedule. God's plan will continue on God's schedule. He knows what he's doing. The late motivational speaker, Zig Ziglar, he's a believer, and he stated this. He said, the pages of your past cannot be rewritten, but the pages of your tomorrows are blank. That's good news, isn't it? A fresh start. A fresh start. Well, Plans. They can be evil, they can be bad. In Jeremiah 29, most of you are familiar with that passage. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, and they're good plans. That Hebrew term plans is the idea of thoughts, ideas, uh, plans. And that same term is used in Genesis 6 
where the Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he had made man on the earth and the, his heart was filled with pain. He saw their plans, their thoughts, and they were evil. I remember Billy Graham years ago saying that the things we see on the big Hollywood screen are what are in human hearts. And when you see these horror movies and these types of things, where does this come from? I think it comes from a depraved human heart. Because out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, wickedness, all, adultery, slander, all kinds of things. They come from our hearts. The wisdom writer pointed out, he said, There are six things the Lord hates, seven that are detestable to him, haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes. Same Hebrew term that's used where God tells, speaks through Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. Schemes, feet that are quick to rush into evil, a false witness who pours out lies, and a man who stirs up dissension among brothers. Proverbs 6, 16 and 19. Isaiah the prophet uh, spoke the evil thoughts and uh, spoke about them and the imaginations. He said, their feet rush into sin. They, they are swift to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are evil thoughts. Same Hebrew term, Isaiah 59, 7. Ruin, destruction marked their way. And again... And Isaiah 65, too, all day long I have held up my hands to an obstinate people who walk in ways not good, pursuing their own imagination. So that's the same Hebrew term, uh, Isaiah 65, too. Uh, the idea is that they can be bad plans and bad schemes as well. But the Lord uh, also has plans. In fact, Psalm 40, verse 5, Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you have done, the things you planned for us. That's the same Hebrew term that's used, where I know the plans I have for you. The things you planned for us, no one can recount to you. Were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. Psalm 40, verse 5. Psalm 92, 5, again the psalmist declared, How great are your works, O Lord, how profound your thoughts, your plans. Plans. I think of a friend of mine. It's funny how some little thing you write down or draw can have a permanency to it. A friend of mine, I remember, I could tell you, take you to the place. I don't know if the barn is still there anymore. But a friend of mine, he was going to build a house, a log house. And he drew it on a matchbook. But it was going to be shaped like a casket. And he did it. It took him years. It's a beautiful place. I think he kind of regretted. Uh, it made it more difficult the way he did. But it started. I still remember that outline on that match. Book of matches. And it was beautiful. He no longer lives there. He sold it. It was absolutely beautiful place. But he found out having a log cabin can be difficult because everything doesn't fit against the wall, right? You have to have it. Uh, it was awkward in that way, but it was beautiful. The Bible tells us how to succeed. Proverbs 15, 22, plans fail for lack of counsel. The idea plans, thoughts. But with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 20, verse 18, make plans by seeking advice. If you wage war, obtain guidance. Proverbs 16, 3, commit to the Lord whatever you do, and your plans, same Hebrew word, your plans will succeed. Commit it to the Lord. Give it to him. Ask him. And here in Jeremiah chapter 29, we have a letter. And so I want you to look at uh, verses 1 to 3. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests, the prophets, and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet who tried to confront the sins of his people as God led him to do this. He didn't want to do it. But God used, chose him as an instrument. In fact, even from the beginning, Jeremiah 1, he said, I can't speak because I'm just a child. 
He says, don't say you're a child. You're going to go to who I tell you to go to. And God had a plan for him before he was born, while he was in his mother's womb. In fact, you can read about that in Jeremiah chapter 1. I wonder how many little Jeremiahs we've killed in our society. But God had a plan. And then God used him to speak, and they would not listen. And so captivities in various orders began to take place. People carried off, and eventually what was going to happen is the temple was going to be destroyed, the city was going to be destroyed, the book of Lamentations, if you read that, young men and women are laying in the streets, pregnant ladies ripped open, brutality. They would not listen. God brought judgment. God carried away people captive. The book of Daniel. Daniel was one of those captives. And the others who we know as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's their pagan names. They had Hebrew names, but they were carried away captive too. And so some of the leaders are taken away. And so they are in this position, and God wants to communicate with them. He didn't forget about them. And so much is tied to the land of Israel, the promises. Abraham, God had told him he would make of him a great nation and that his ancestors would inhabit that land where all these Canaanites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, etc. were. And it was by faith that he journeyed. And then Isaac and Jacob and then Eventually, the Hebrews came out of Egypt and they came to that promised land in Joshua and they conquered the land and attempted to anyway. And the tribes were to take these certain areas. This was part of their promise. And now they are carried away, no longer there. I think sometimes farmers can probably relate better than anyone else because if you have farmed the land, let's say you're, it's a third generation farm, you're tied to that land. In Wisconsin, of course, your hunting was tied to that too. And you know the fields and you've seen it changed. And then, in fact, in the 80s, when there was this great interest crunch, and farmers were losing their, their, their homes, their farms. I remember my parents writing to me at Moody that another farmer had committed suicide because they felt like such a failure. Maybe it was a third generation farm. Well, how do you think these people felt? Their whole ancestry, everything is tied to this land. Abraham was really the first Jew. You know, God said he would make of him a great nation, and he waited 25 years before the promise came, Isaac, that child, the promise. Then he was even willing to offer that child up because he believed that God could even raise the dead. God didn't let him do it. But he had faith in God, and now they have let down their ancestors, their forefathers. They had let them down. They had let God down. But God still had a plan. Verse 2, this was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court official and the leader of the Jews in Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisa, son of Shaphan, and to Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord, all, verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, so God is speaking, This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't it Nebuchadnezzar that did it? God said, I am behind all of this. I am in control of this. God is in control. And sometimes he uses people that don't even know him. At this point, I don't think Nebuchadnezzar knew him, but he was his tool. Years ago, I had come out of my moose hunt, once in a lifetime moose hunt. And so I was up by Ely, and then I drove up to Cook, and I wanted to get my bear baiting signs down since I was up that far, and I was exhausted. And I went, and I actually almost blacked out, 
at one, one time. I was just, and um, I got to my vehicle. I'm way back in the Cabotogama State Forest, way back. No more roads back there. Back beyond that spur, way back there. And my vehicle wouldn't start, wouldn't even turn. And you feel so helpless. It's dark, getting dark. So I talked myself into this. I thought, I heard somewhere, if you can get an automatic going fast enough, you can get it started. <laughs> so I'm parked going up the hill like this. So I'm going to try and swing it around, and then I can get it. Next thing, I'm just across the road, and <laughs> well, the vehicle won't start. It's in October. I start walking. It's during the middle of the week. I start walking. I mean, I have miles to walk. And I'm praying. I said, God, please wake up some Christian and have them drive back here. That's what I was praying. God, have some Christian drive back here. Wake them up. It's like 10 o'clock at night. But I'm walking now. I've been walking for a while. It was a pretty moonlit night. I said, God, I'm just asking you to wait, shake, just have some Christian come back here. I see this pair of headlights coming down this gravel road. And it was two guys. I don't think they were Christians. <laughs> they worked for um, a waste management. It was a father and son. Son was probably like 25 or so. And they said, <laughs> I said, can you help me? I said, I don't have any money. I, I, I don't have cash, but I got a check. If you will j jump me back there. And, and he says, well, um, just jump in the back. And I said, I was praying that somebody would come. And the young man said probably, I'm not kidding you, five times. He said, this is so strange because it was dark. And I told my dad we were going to check on stands, deer stands for the next day. I said, let's just drive back and see if we can tell, even though it's dark, if we can tell how much is logged off. He said, this is so strange because, and he said that about five times. Well, I believe God was behind that. Amen. They gave me a jump. I got out of there. Well, God is behind sometimes very negative things. I think maybe not only did God use them in my life, I gave them a couple of devotions for deer hunters. I think God may have been trying to work in their life. Yeah. You some guy that's stuck back there with a vehicle that won't start. He can use the negative things in our lives, can he? This is what they're all Lord Almighty. Verse 4 again. The God of Israel says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and settle down, plant gardens and eat what they produce, Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not list, let the prophets and diviners among you Deceive you, do not listen to the dreams you, in, they encourage, you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. What was happening is there were false prophets telling them what they wanted to hear. This is only going to be two years. It's just going to be a temporary thing. God's going to bring you back. No way is God going to let the city be destroyed. No way will the temple be destroyed. We have all these promises in the Psalms. No way is this going to happen. And God says, it is going to happen. And don't listen to these liars, these false prophets, who are telling you what you want to hear. But I have a plan for you, even though it may not be what you want to hear. I still have a plan for you. And I want you, in your situation, to bloom where you have been planted. I want you to bloom. I want you to blossom. I want you to produce. I want your 
kids to marry. I want you to pray for these places where you have been taken into captivity because as those places prosper, you're going to prosper. God had a plan for them. Verse 10, this is what the Lord Almighty says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. Remember Daniel, how he saw that the captivity was close to being turned around? That was the 70 years. That was when Daniel was praying. He would open up his window and pray towards Jerusalem because that, he was acting upon the promises of God. Solomon, when he had dedicated the temple, he had prayed that when, and God had said that when somebody, they're carried off in the foreign land, they pray towards this place. He's going to hear that prayer. That's what Daniel was doing. Daniel, when some of the great events of his life took place, he was about 80 years old plus. When he was thrown into the lion's den, he was not a young strapping man. He was at least 80 years old. Some of the great things that took place in his life, we see a steadfastness, was when he was towards the end of his life. Here, when we look at this portion of scripture, we see that, first of all, God is able and wants to communicate to his people. We need to remember that the Lord is able to speak to us no matter where we may be. They were in exile, but God wanted to speak to them. He speaks through his word. That's the primary way. And if you are uh, studying the scriptures and spending time in God's word, God is seeking to speak to you, and he is speaking to you. And everything else has to come under what God's word says. We try everything. Believe not every spirit, John said, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. So we spend time in the word of God. His word, his spirit prompts us. Sometimes circumstances dictate. Angels, people, preachers, visions, dreams, all of those things God can use, but they always must be in line with the word of God. Sometimes people come up with the craziest things that are really contrary to Scripture. But he can speak like that, and he does that. God is able and wants to communicate to his people, and God is in control. God was in control despite their past sins. God was in control despite their present situation. They were in exile, but God was in control. He was still in control. It was as if the people of Israel were on a great ship. And if you've ever gone on a cruise, and we've had the privilege, Beth's folks took us on a cruise, uh, each of the kids, and we went up to St. Lawrence, was it? Uh, up to Prince Edward Island. And uh, it's a beautiful thing to be on, and I love walking. You're going, and especially on that, you can see sea life or, or Alaska, and you're walking around the ships like a quarter of a mile around or something, and you're moving and you're seeing, and it's beautiful. It was as if they were on a big ship. They wanted to jump off the ship, and God says, no. But I want you to make the best of your time on the ship. And that's really what it was. They were in exile, and God says, I want you to to prosper in this place. I don't want you to be just always thinking about getting back because you're not coming back for 70 years. I am disciplining. I'm going to show you. And here, God was in control despite their present situation. When we are in negative, a negative situation, when we are surrounded by unwanted or even unwarranted circumstances, sometimes we can be in a situation because somebody else has done something. But when we are in those circumstances, it's hard to believe that God could possibly have a plan for us. But this is the time when we need to keep waiting on the Lord. We need to keep looking to him. God's plans for us cannot be stopped or even soured by negative circumstances unless we respond in such a way that we ourselves step out of what God has planned for us and we step out through unbelief or rebellion. And that's what God was trying to Tell them not to do. Don't rebel against this. But where you're at, 
Do the best that you can. Bloom where you're planted. Pray. Seek my faith. Although the eternal God's time schedule is often not what we humans would desire, his time schedule is perfect in design. And by faith, we have to look at that. I uh, heard something yesterday. I was listening to an old Earl Nightingale. And he was talking about uh, the guy that wrote Moby Dick. Do you know that that was a total failure during his lifetime? It was actually decades later when the book became popular. And it's been worth millions. They make movies about it. But it was, a, in one sense, it was kind of a, it would have seemed like a waste. Be faithful in what God has called you and me to do. If he can do that in the world, he can do that if when God is involved, when we're doing his will, when we're seeking to follow him and to serve him, he can do it. Someone has said, don't doubt in the dark what God has shown in the light. And just because we do not know exactly, and sometimes we don't even know remotely what God is doing, that doesn't mean he doesn't know what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. Just because we don't understand his plan doesn't mean he doesn't have one. God is able and wants to communicate to his people. That was true then. And I want you to think about this. This message was coming to a group of people who had blown it. How much more for a person who hasn't blown it? Doesn't God, he wanted them to know, even though you blew it, folks, I still care about you and I'm still going to be at work. Well, if we are seeking to walk in his way, trying to stay close to him, trying to be obedient to him, doing what he's called us to do, not shirking our responsibility, not failing, then we can be sure that he will respond and he will guide and he will direct. We can sure that he has good plans for us. And God is able and wants to communicate. God is in control and God is concerned. The Lord himself has plans. And notice these plans are for his people. Do you know that God has plans for you? Do you really believe that he has a plan for you? He does. He knew when you were going to come into this world, and he knows the second you're going to leave. Acts 17, the apostle Paul spoke on Mars Hill, and he said, God has appointed the times and the places where we live that we might seek after him and find him, though he's not far from any one of us. You were put in this time period. I was put in this time period. Not 100 years ago, not 200 years ago, if you go to a museum, you look at some of these beautiful works of art, a portrait of somebody, I've always wondered, you were in that time period, I'm in this time period. God put you at this time period. He put me in here. Although there will always be people who will choose to rebel against God and in so doing may bring trouble, pain, anguish, and, and deepest types of hurt, to those who do not deserve it. This does not and cannot stop God from pouring out his riches, blessings, and fulfilling his perfect plan for you. Now, this is for sure. There were people that were carried away captive that were trying to do what was right. But they suffered right along with the rebels. And sometimes what somebody else chooses to do will bring us suffering and pain. But we are to remain faithful to him. A woman goes and she buys some sugar or a man and flour and some apples. What do you think she's going to do? Apple pie. An apple pie. We could say she's probably got a plan to make an apple pie. He's got a plan to make an apple pie. Someone uh, gets some two by fours and some metal and Something else, some nails, screws, whatever. We figure he's probably going to build something or she's going to build something. Well, it shouldn't surprise us that God has a plan for us. The Lord has promised to respond. He re promised to respond to them. He says, then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and listen to this. And I will listen to you. Verse 12. The Lord promised to respond to them. The Lord promised to reveal himself to them. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Verses 13 and 14. 
God promises to respond. I do think that he is sometimes so hurt because we just do not seek him. We do not respond to him. We do not cry out to him. We do not want his help. We want to try to do it ourselves. We need his help, don't we? We need his help. And he promised to reveal himself. He says, you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Are you seeking him with all your heart? Are you doing that? Are you serving him with all your strength, with everything you got? And I ask myself that too. I want to be faithful. The Lord promised to respond to them. The Lord promised to reveal himself to them. The Lord promised to return them to the land. Now, would they see it? Not very many of them would. They'd have to be awful little. Like Daniel, we're not told he came back. But he lived to see the return start. He saw it by faith. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I banished you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. But they could look into the future. And this is the reality, too. What you and I do today affects the future. I think of that Steve Green song. Let all who come behind me find me faithful. How does that go? Anybody know it? Dave, you probably know it. Uh, you could probably sing it. How about you, Brenda? Yeah, I, 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 sing it a little loud. Come on. Sings with me. <laughs> I'm just putting... Faithful. There we got it. It's in it. What? It's in our hymnal. Yeah. But anyway, the idea is we want those behind us to know that we were seeking him. It may be your great nephew, a great, maybe your cousin's third generation son that is influenced. But if you are faithful, God will use it. And may that be our prayer. The Lord promised return. And the Lord does not always, I'm sorry to put you guys on the spot like that, but the Lord does not always remove negative situations from our life. But if we will allow him, he can use situations to remove negative things from our life. He uses negative things to often remove negative things from us. He is the potter, we are the clay. I am amazed at how a person can take a block of marble and somehow they see within that some, something that they can sculpture. I'm amazed at how anybody can do anything like that. I have um, a guy who's become a friend. He's a, a Mormon fella. We just, I just love him. He bought a bird dog from us, and he's a traditional archer, and he's a falconer, and he is an artist. He does uh, life-size sculptures. I've seen it. I mean, he's incredible. The artistic ability in that. And we just have a kind of a connection, even though we don't... And I've prayed with him. We've prayed, you know. Uh, I prayed, I guess. And, and I love him. I just can't help but because we have so much, I admire so much in him. I'll put it that way. And God is the great sculpture. He is doing something in your life right now, maybe through not knowing what you're going to do or how you're going to do it, but he is doing something in your life that will last a long time, long after you're gone because you're going to stand before God one day and you're going to be in his presence. And I do believe we are not going to be uh, thanking him for all the great things. We're going to be thanking him for the difficult things he took us through. And we see the great things he brought out of our life as a result of that. Let's keep looking to him. Negative situations are often used by God to conform us to the image of his dear son. He uses them to change us. Negative situations are always under God's control. They are never too big or bulky for him. 
This was true in this situation. Negative situations are often used by God to chastise us. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And negative situations, get a hold of this one, can be changed by God in an instant. He can turn it just like that. Joseph went from prison to prime minister in a few hours. Not one day, actually in a few hours. God can change all kinds of things. Let's have our, our musician come forward and we will continue on here. Well, thank you, Pastor Tom, for great encouraging words for the new year. Um, <clears throat> you'll have to open up to maybe a crispier portion of your hymnal there. You've got to go all the way back to hymn number 811. It's entitled Another Year is Dawning, but you'll recognize the tune. So let's all rise and we'll close with hymn 811, Another Year is Dawning. Mm -hmm. 